Good morning, everyone. I hope life is treating you well. We are here on Monday. That means we just went through a weekend. It's always good to go through the weekend. Let's see. We're here today. We're talking about something very important. No, not just pot odds. It is the sunk cost fallacy. Now, you may say, what is this? Essentially, it means you've already invested something in life or in poker, and now it may not come through, and you're annoyed about that. I actually had this happen this weekend. Amy and I got on the bus to take James across town. We were going to go to a, a little shopping mall for him to walk around and hang out. And... Um, well, it didn't pan out. What happened is the, the bus took forever. So we were sitting on the bus for like 30 minutes. And then we eventually got the idea, hey, we should probably get off this bus and go do something else with our lives instead of sit on the bus. So, you know, we were kind of pot committed, or so some people would think. We'd been on the bus for a while. We were actually kind of close to being there. We were probably two thirds through the trip, but we decided to get off anyway. A lot of people I think would have just sat there and stuck with it, thinking that I've already put in this much time, I can't quit now, and they would have gotten off. But you have to understand, quitting is a valuable skill. You must learn if you want to succeed in poker and in life. It is okay to quit, especially if you are not having fun, you do not have an edge, etc., etc. So that brought me to the topic of pot odds. I'm in the process of making a very big masterclass, for those who do not know. And um, I'm sharing it with a few people. And one of the people I was sharing it with said they didn't quite get the pot odds. Now, I was kind of surprised at that because this guy has won $200,000 playing poker. Certainly not chump change. And I was surprised at this. He was not confused by basic pot odds. He was confused by more advanced stuff, like when there's a bet, raise, and re-raise, discussing uh, pot odds and minimum defense frequency. So we're going to talk about that today. Someone says, what's up with the Jacksons behind me? Oh, well, I'm out of hundreds. I lost all my money. So it'd be great if you all could subscribe or like this, uh, this channel. That way, maybe we get to turn the Jacksons into Franklins or who's on the $500 bill. I know someone there knows. Tell me who's on the 500. We need to get those. So let's talk about pot odds. Whenever you are in a poker situation, what's going to happen is there's going to be a pot and someone's going to bet. So let's pretend the pot is $20, one unit, okay? Let's suppose your opponent bets $20, okay? Opponent bets $20 into this pot. Pot becomes now $40. You have to put in $20 more to call. Very, very basic situation. This is called two to one. Now, I actually don't like using odds. I think odds are kind of silly for poker for most things really, you want to know how often do you need to win to justify calling. So in this scenario, when you're getting two to one, we have two to our one, how often do we need to win? Well, what you do, it's very simple. You take your one unit that you're putting in divided by the total amount you can win, which is $60, three units. One divided by three, how much is that? Can someone do some math? Let's get out the calculator. We do, uh-oh, what do I do? I don't want an ad. We do 20 divided by 60 equals 33% of the time. 0.33, you just divide it. You just move the decimal over two spaces to get the percentage. Geico apparently thinks it's a good idea to advertise on um, this calculator. So anyway, 33% is how often you need to win there. But some people say two to one, shouldn't that be 50%? No, that would be two, four, one. It's very confusing in gambling. Um, if you if you um, play video poker, the odds there are always listed as blank for blank, which means that you uh, you don't get your money back whenever you win. You get the amount back. In poker, though, and in virtually all gambling games, you are getting your money back when you win. So if there's a $20 bet and a $20 pot and you have to put in $20 more, it's one unit divided by three units, so you need to win 33% of the time. Basic, simple, nice, nothing really to see there. Next.
Let's instead pretend the pot is three units, okay? Let's assume the pot is three units, $60. And now, let's suppose the opponent bets 40, two units, okay? Five units total. These all go into the pot. We have to put in two to call. So it's two divided by all of this, which is seven, right? Two divided by seven, which would be uh, 40 divided by 140. How often do you need to win then? Let's get out the calculator again. 40 divided by 140 equals 28% of the time. For those on uh, Instagram, I know it's backwards. Sorry about that. 28, 28.5% of the time, okay? This means when you run your equity against your opponent's range, you need to see if it's more than 28.5% of the time. If it is more than 28.5% 28 of the time, you pretty much have always an easy continue. Now, you may want to raise or you may want to call, but you're certainly not going to fold. Um, there are some times where you may not be getting the right pot odds. Let's say on the flop, okay, you have a flush draw. Your opponent bets 20 and, or 40 into 100, as we just saw there. Well, now, you know you're only going to get there on the turn about 20% of the time with your flush draw, but you needed to win 28% of the time. That's less, right? But if you do make that flush, there's a decent chance you're going to win more money. These are called your implied odds. That's because whenever you do hit your hand, you're very likely to get paid off. Also in this situation, say your opponent's all in for $40 into the 100 pot. Now... You get to see two cards, and with two cards to come, you're going to win with your flush draw about 40% of the time. 40 is more than 28, therefore you also have an easy call. You're going to find very often in No Limit Hold'em, you should not really be looking to fold your draws, your good draws at least. That's usually going to be a pretty big mistake. So now let's take a look at a different situation. If anyone has any questions about this situation, it's quite basic. Really, you just do whatever number's over here. Actually, let's do, it. Let's do an example like this. Let's say pot is $60, three units, okay? And our opponent overbets. They're going to bet all of this. Let's count and see how much it is. We have one, two, three, four, five, six. They're now betting six into three. Okay? Remember six. We have six here, three here. Let's find six more. We'll probably have six more laying around here somewhere. One, two, three. Oh, only three here. Four, five, six. Okay. Six more. So how many is total in the pot? If we do our math right, it should be 15. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. Okay? 6 divided by 15 is what? You may ask, do you need a calculator for this? And the answer is no. You can, you can just know this is going to be 40%. 6 divided by 15 equals... Oops, I did it wrong. Let's see. 6 divided by 15 equals 40%. God, what am I doing? I promise it's 40%. That means you need to win 40% of the time with your range. Easy. Okay. Now, what happens next? Let's suppose we have a very simple spot again. We have $20 pot. Our opponent bets $20, okay? Let's say now we want to raise to $60, okay? So I'm going to put in 60 here, okay? 60 more is coming in. Now, what pot odds is the opponent getting? Think about this, right? How much more do they have to put in? They have to put in 40 more to win this entire pot. So we have this entire pot plus our opponent's 40 more. So we have 40 divided by this total amount. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. So they need to win 40 divided by 140, which we already did the math. That was 28% of the time to continue. Okay? What if then they actually decided not to put in the 40, but they decided to make it 100 on top? They bet 20. We made it 60. They're now making it 160. This is where it gets kind of convoluted. It's nice to have a computer in front of me. But we're doing our best with this, these little bills. So now, they have to put in 140 on top. Okay? So there was the 40. This is the pot we had. So we're going to put in 100 on top of the 40. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Okay, we have it all. This is all going into the pot. Okay? How much more does the other player have to call? They put in 60, now it's 100 more. So they have to put in 100 more to win this whole pile. Let's find 100. 
One, two, three, four, five. All of this is going to go into the pot. So now this player's pot odds, who raised to 60 and then got re-raised to 160, has to put in 100 to win this whole pile, which is how much? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17. 5 divided by 17. Does anybody know what that is off the top of their head? You can just estimate. It's okay to estimate. You do not have to be exact. We know, well, 5 divided by 15 is 33%, right? So this is going to be a little bit less than 33%, maybe like 28% or so. Let's get out the calculator. 5 divided by 18 equals 20, 7.5%, 27.8%. So 28%. So if the person in this situation is going to realize 28% equity, they need to continue. So that's pot odds. That's how you think about it. You always want to ask, how much more is it for me to call? It's not um, how much is the total or anything like that. It's how much more must I put in. Once you put the money in the pot, it is gone. It is not yours. So that's pot odds. If anyone has any questions about pot odds, let me know. They're really not that advanced, but it's important to understand pot odds because without understanding pot odds, you will not know when you should call and when you should hold. Nim says, three errors already in calculating. Not sure what you're saying, Nims. That's okay. I think we have it close enough to write. If there are any errors in this, please realize. We're running a live show here and this has not been rehearsed. <laughs> Okay, let's now talk about minimum defense frequency. Okay, whenever you, someone bets, and it's back to you, you need to defend some portion of the time. Okay? So let's say someone, there's a pot of $20, our opponent bets 20. First question is, if they are completely bluffing, they have 0% equity, which does not happen on the flop too often, but if they do have 0% equity, how often do they need to steal this pot to show an immediate profit? Well, it's very easy. You take their bet divided by the total pot. That's it. 20 divided by 40 is 50%, right? One divided by two is 50%. That's how often they need to steal to immediately profit. Now, there's the idea of the minimum defense frequency, which is the opponent now has to defend one minus whatever that number is we just saw, 50%. So one minus 50% is 50%. That means the caller has to defend with at least half of their entire range. Okay. Think about this though, no limit hold'em. On a generic board, let's say, you're going to make a pair or better about a third of the time. Okay. But you need to defend half of the time here. There's a problem, right? You're if you only continue with pairs and better, you're only gonna be defending a third of the time. But you need to defend at least half of the time, at least. Assuming your opponent is good, which, you know, maybe your opponent's not. But if your opponent is good, you need to defend half the time. So what does half of a range look like? Very often it's going to be like any gut shot, straight draw, any flush draw, any, any straight draw at all. Um, quite often ace high if the board's very dry. It is important to understand, though, that on a very coordinated board, very often ace high does not need to be floated because you have a lot of draws and a lot of pairs available. But on a very uncoordinated board, very often just straight over cards need to be defended. Like say it comes 9-4-2 and your opponent bets even pot, well, king-queen could very easily be in the top 50% of your range. Let's take a different example though. Let's say instead the pot is, let's make it $80. Okay? And let's say your opponent bets 20. This is what you see happen in tournaments a lot and in high stakes cash games just because this is usually a very good play if your opponents don't know how to defend. They're putting in 20 to win a total of 80. So how often does their total bluffs need to work? 20 divided by 100, 20% of the time. Okay? That means you need to defend with 80% of your range. Well, what does 80% of your range look like? That's going to be everything besides just like the absolute garbage. That's usually going to be any sort of backdoor flush draw, any sort of king high, any sort of queen high a lot of the time. And most people don't defend often enough. And this is why you see, especially in tournaments where you don't really want to risk a lot of your stack, people will fold way too much, which makes making almost a blind continuation bet quite a powerful strategy. I discussed it in my first book that's up there, one of those green ones, Secrets of Professional Tournament Poker, that very often you can just make a blind continuation bet because your opponents will not defend often enough. 
Now, the times they will defend often enough, where it's kind of easy to defend often enough, is when the board is very coordinated. Because, like I said, they're going to have a lot of draws and whatnot. But anytime it's just one big card and two little cards, you need to be betting very, very frequently. Because most people are going to fold unless they have a pair or ace high, and they're folding too often. So, next. What about if we have a $20 pot, our opponent bets 20 and now we want to raise to 60 okay? How often does our $60 bet need to succeed? Well, remember, we're not risking only 40 now because we are putting in 60. It's very different. We're putting in 60 more, not 40. Because if we were to call, we'd be calling and then raising 20, but that's not exactly how I have to look at it. You have to look at it more as we're putting in 60 to win 40. So 60 divided by 40 is what? 60%. Okay? That means our pull-up needs to succeed 60% of the time to show an immediate profit. Now, think about in your games, your opponent raises pre-flop, you call in the big blind, flop comes anything, they check, or sorry, you check, they bet, they continuation bet pot, and you raise them to three times their bet. They need to defend 40% of the time because our steel needs to work 60, right? Remember, one minus 60% equals 40%. So they have to defend with 40% of their range. That means essentially any pair and maybe some, uh, maybe a few slightly weaker hands like ace-high. Are people really calling a check raise on the flop with any pair and ace-high? And I would venture to say that in almost all games, they are not. Let's imagine we make it even a little bit bigger. Let's say we made it 80. Let's get back, get back out the math. We're now making it 80, okay? 80 to win how much? 120. So now we need to defend they need to defend 33% of the time, which means they need to call our big check raise with any pair. I think that that is um, not going to happen very often. Fernando says 60 divided by 100, not 60 divided by 40. Well, I messed up if I said that. 60 divided by the total pot is what I was referring to. Sorry about that. Again, this has not been rehearsed. We're winging it with money in our hands. I'm doing my best. Okay, so are people really going to defend against a four times check raise on the flop with worse than top pair? I mean, probably not, right? Unless they're calling stations. So that's quite a powerful strategy. So whenever you are looking at your minimum defense frequency, you always want to ask, how often does the opponent need to steal if, they're, if they are um, total bluffing? And remember, also, it's very important that that's the minimum you need to defend. So if the minimum is 33% of your range, any pair, that means you actually need to defend more because your opponent's going to have equity with their bluffs. Say it does come queen 7-3, and the opponent check raises jack 10 with a backdoor flush draw, well, they're going to win some tiny portion of the time, 10 or 15%. That means you actually need to defend more than minimum defense frequency. And a lot of people don't quite get that. They think they need to defend it exactly, the minimum defense frequency, but that is usually not true. Now, something else that comes into play is the minimum defense frequency is not necessarily how often you need to defend. Sometimes you need to defend less, and this is where poker gets tough. So remember back to that situation I said where you raise preflop, from let's say under the gun, big blind calls, and it comes ace king four, right? Or ace king six, let's make it even worse. In this scenario, the under the gun player has all the good aces, all the big pairs, and the player defending the big blinds that have all sorts of garbage, right? In that scenario, the preflop aggressor can bet tiny, like 20% pot, which means, well, let's just show you, they're betting 20% pot. Remember they have, uh, that would be 20 into 100. 20 divided by 120 is what? 18%, right? So they need to, the opponent needs to defend 82% of their range. But they cannot, and they should not. You may say, well, why shouldn't they? Because they have such a range disadvantage and such a lack of playability on the turn in the river that they are going to drastically under-realize whatever equity they have. And so whenever you have a severe range advantage, or whenever you have a severe range disadvantage, if you have the advantage, you want to be betting very frequently, often very small. Whenever you have a disadvantage, you need to be over folding, folding more than you should. Um, the main time 
you should be defending roughly the minimum defense frequency, and usually almost exactly at the minimum defense frequency, is when you find yourself on the river against a good opponent, and you know they are using a balanced strategy. On the river, their bluffs now have no equity. If they're using a polarized betting strategy, as most people will if you're also good, they need to beat your. Uh, they need to win. Well, I'm sorry. They need to have some bluffs and some value vests, right? And it's usually very clear which is which. So, if they structure their range well, you do you do need to defend roughly at the minimum defense frequency. That's usually going to be right. But on the earlier streets, it gets a little bit clouded. This says, "Always golden. This channel is going to blow up. I hope it does. I do my best." Um. D. Nelson says, if they do this big check raise frequently, couldn't you just wait for a good spot? Well, what happens is you're going to lose all the small pots, and you're going to win the big pots, but the big pots you win are not going to be big enough. That's really the, th the issue, is that if you do wait for just top pair or better, first off, you're going to lose sometimes, which is worth, worth noting. It's, and also, it's not like your opponent just blindly blasts off on the turn in the river. Those, are, those things are not, they're just not going to happen if your opponent is good. So I would suggest in your games, especially if you're against a loose preflop raiser who continuation bets too much, check raise. And check raise big. Put him in a bad spot. Now, you may find some people are calling stations in your game, in which case you don't want to bluff nearly as often. Um, also, minimum defense frequency gets a lot of people in trouble, especially when they're playing small and medium stakes games, because they think, again, going back to the situation, opponent bet 20 into 40. They need to steal it a third of the time. To show a profit, so I have to defend 66% of my range. Problem though is, what if this guy betting half pot is just a nit? What if this guy is only betting top pair and better? Well, now you're supposed to be overfolding. You're supposed to adjust to take advantage of the mistakes that your opponents make, right? So if this guy does not bet with his junk, he just only bets top pair and better, well, now you need to be folding a ton. You should be drastically overfolding because this player has a hole in their game. Let's suppose instead we know our opponent actually checks back all of their top pairs, as some people will do for, you know, pot control. And then they only bet with their nut hands, which there aren't going to be very many nut hands on, you know, king 7-3, and all of their garbage. Well, now they have almost all bluffs in their range. So if they have almost all bluffs in their range, now you should be defending way wider. Like 100%, perhaps, if you know they're going to fold you a check raise. In that scenario, you can literally check raise 100% of hands. So poker's not as easy as just running the math and um, going with it. You also need to figure out what they are doing incorrect. You need to adjust accordingly. We need some questions coming in. If you have any questions, feel free to type them in. What's a limp raise range from a tough player in the hijack look like? Oh, I have no clue. No one's open. They should not be open limping, most likely. Some people will, though. What's the best kind of mindset to have when playing? How do you stay in the zone for long sessions? Don't be on drugs. Don't be distracted. Don't... Um, be gambling on other things, don't have fights with anyone else. Really, it has to do with, you know, don't don't be distracted. Also, you have to care about the poker you're playing. A lot of people, they just go and they want to have a beer and mess around with their friends. And um, I think that's probably not such a good idea. I think I need a lapel pin today. Um, let's see. Player trends are more useful than the math. Well, they are, especially in the small stakes games. And the high stakes games, I completely disagree with that. I think that in general, in the high stakes games, math drastically overrides everything because in the high stakes games, it's a very important concept. Most of the time, you're not going to know what your opponents are doing wrong, right? They may continuation bet a little bit too much, but you won't really realize it because you're not playing very many hands with them. Usually, what's going to be happening is they may make one play slightly too much, but you just don't understand it. And, or you can't realize, and if you can't realize it, you don't know what to do to exploit it. So if you just play strong GTO, you're going to be tough to play against. Best term poker book not written by you. I don't know. I like Gus Hansen's book, Every Hand Reveal. Let's know how loose aggressive players play. Dean Nelson says he saw my post where I won a tournament with Choppy at it. Choppy was a guy, I forget his name off the top of my head, but a very good online player. He was, whoa, kick, kick the camera. Um, he was um, player of the year on Pocket Fives, I think, or number one on Pocket Fives for a long time. Very good player. Anyway, I liked Every Hand Revealed. I think it's good. Can you beat that nit with a GTO strategy, though? Oh, absolutely. Nits under defend. They don't defend their equity often enough. They instead fold 
too often. So if they're folding too often, what does that mean? Well, it means that, that you're going to win all of the small pots. And they're going to try to win all the big pots. Remember, they are under defending. So if they're under defending, what does that mean for you? It means that they are not calling often enough. How do you beat people who don't call often enough? You make lots of small bluffs. And if you make lots of small bluffs, you're going to demolish them. Let's see. Seven, two seven seven wants to thanks me for this recommendation of this app I suggested a long time ago. Made 500 bucks in three months. Yeah, I made like $2,000 playing this free application. It doesn't exist anymore, though. I guess they ran out of money or something. But yeah, that was good. I try to always give you all free money whenever I just find free money. Um, yeah, so it's good. Let's see. Playing your first big anti-tournament. Any slight adjustments needed? Not really, unless you get very short. I think whenever you get very short, it does start to become relevant, but try to not get short. How about that? Let's see. Oh, I missed a comment. Someone said, someone typed in something. It, this is program I'm using doesn't let me scroll back up. It's silly, I know. Um, someone asked about something to the effect of, does this matter for tournaments where there are ICM implications? Quite often, you do need to be under defending. Quite often, people are going to be playing a little bit tighter. So again, if, remember what we said earlier. If they're playing a little bit tighter, you need to defend less often, right? That is the adjustment you need to make. Well, I played the 25K in Baja Mar. Unless I run out of money, um, I already had to downgrade my 100s to 20s, so there's a chance we could run out of 20s. They would have to get downgraded to 10s, and it's, it's a lot of 10s to carry to buy into the um, 25K. I would probably do it, though. Let's see. If you sit on a random table, how long do you need before you have an idea of people's strategies? Often you can just look and tell. Quite often, um, most people just, it's very clear they are either recreational or professional, and that alone is quite a very big, um, a, a good bit of advice. Uh, Gang says, he's from the Bahamas, awesome. Well, come say hi if you see me. Don't, I think Poker Stars is rigged. Um, I don't think Poker Stars is rigged, no. What's those monies? These are monies we use to demonstrate a concept of pot odds. Very important to understand pot odds. And minimum defense frequency. Yeah, it definitely sucks. The Bahamas does not allow citizens to play. It's an interesting concept there. Connor says he's playing a free roll with no ante. Just play tight. Tight play is usually good in those games. What's the most effective way to learn poker from my perspective? Learn how to play fundamentally sound and then adjust to take advantage of whatever your opponents do wrong. If they make a lot of mistakes, then you should... Um, adjust very hard. And if they're not making a lot of mistakes, then you should probably just play strong GTO. I discuss all this over at pokercoaching.com, by the way. Um, you can get a free trial, completely free to sign up. So check it out. John, do you think 888 is rigged though? Smiley face. No, I do not think any of the major online sites or any of the online sites are rigged. I think that people who think they're rigged are often just annoyed that they're losing and they're trying to blame someone else. Don't blame someone else for your problems. Quite often it's your fault. It's almost 1 a.m. How do you keep us heads up? Oh, wait. How do you keep us head up when constantly running? Uh, two girls. I'm not exactly sure what you're asking. Oh, wait. How do you keep... I don't know what you're asking, two girls. I'll type it again. But no one from Avon, a no info on, on a player is to often play against them as if they were good until you have more info. No, you always have info. That's what a lot of people don't quite understand. They think... I don't know anything about my opponent because I haven't played with him any. Well, very often you do know something about them. You see their chip stack, right? If you move to a tournament and someone has all the tiny anti-chips, they're probably winning a lot of small pots. If they have a short stack or like a very a stack with no anti-chips, they're probably tight. If they're wearing flamboyant clothes and playing the first three hands, they're probably really loose. You know, you, you can make adjustments and assumptions right off the bat. Do you prefer tournament or cash? Well, ca cash is better as long as it's hundreds. I'm not, I mean, if I had to pick between $20 bills or a, playing a tournament, I'd rather play a $20 bill. Or I'd rather play a tournament. If I could get $100 bills, I'd rather keep the hundreds. On the bubble with sevens, do I call off a cutoff jam from the small blind? Uh, depends on how many chips you have. Probably not though.
He Nelson said, his baby mom's blames you for all of her problems. Yeah. All right. Two Girl says, how do you keep your spirits high when constantly losing to bad beats? You have to understand that it does not matter. You have to keep a big bankroll. Most people, when they go to play poker, they buy in for $20, and their remaining bankroll is, um, well, $40. If they lose this, they're like, oh my god, I just lost a third of my money. Lit on fire. Can you bring the lighter over here, please? Oh, no. You're not supposed to light money on fire on the stream. Um, say they play again, they lose this. Now they're down to just 20 bucks left. They buy in, they lose this, and then they're out. They're out. They're long gone. They're broke. They have to go back to work. And that's the problem. You have to keep a war chest of money piled away for whenever you need it. Because, you know, sometimes some falls off. You just lose it. And um, that's okay. As long as you are properly bankrolled, it will not matter so much. I think a lot of people play drastically under bankrolled, and they care about the money too much. They care about the results. Also, a lot of the time, people will not play very often. When you only play once a month, right, it feels really bad when you lose 12 tournaments in a row because you just lost a whole year. But in reality, that's not much play at all. So you may not be putting in enough volume. You may be playing under bankrolled. You may be playing whenever you don't have an edge. If you do these things on a regular basis, it's not going to go so well for you. Will I be adding cash game content to my site? It definitely will be. We actually, I actually have... I made probably 10 cash game quizzes just the other day. They'll be going up over the next few months. Also, Matt Affleck has a lot of cash game quizzes. Yeah, so two girls, if you don't have a chest full of money, understand, whenever I first started, I had um, less money than this. I started 15 years ago with $50. This would have been a ton of money to me back in the day. And I broke this into 100 little pieces. And I kept those 100 little pieces... And I grinded it up. Sometimes I won, sometimes I lost. More often than not, it grinded up. A lot of people think I have to play big. I have to play for money that's really meaningful to me. But I think if you play for money that money that is meaningful, but also not, oh my God, it's all of my money, I think that will allow you to play way more soundly. Do I have a YouTube channel? Yes, Jonathan Little Poker. Oh no, uh, youtube.com slash float the turn. What's the best bankroll? So I have a, an article on bankroll. It's called the Bankroll Bible. JonathanLittlePoker.com slash bankroll. How can you play poker and not care about the results, though? Oh, I don't care about the results at all. I only care about winning equity. Your goal when you're playing poker is to make the best decisions you possibly can. And that's it. doesn't matter if you win or lose. It sounds crazy to a lot of people, but it really doesn't. It matters if you win or lose over the long term, but the long term is way longer than most people think. I mean, I've had World Series of Pokers where I've had no caches in like 40 tournaments, and that makes some people say, oh my god, that's insane. But then, you know... Shortly after, I'll win a tournament for a million dollars or something. Or maybe you don't. Maybe you just keep going on a downswing. And it's okay. It's okay. You have to understand that that's what you signed up for. A lot of people just don't understand what they signed up for. They th think they're supposed to win every single time. And that's clearly just not the case. Do we have any advice for how to keep a healthy balance between live and online? No? No? Be okay with playing both games. I think it's something that you have to be okay doing. Um, I would definitely suggest everyone get good at online poker first. Because um, that's where you get to play against people who really care about the money. And you're playing for often uh, not a ton of money. So you get to get a lot of experience against good people with relatively little investment of your money. Like I said, whenever I started, I had 50 bucks, right? And you don't need a ton of money to grind it up. You just have to play a lot. One thing almost no one does is they don't play nearly enough. They think I can play once or twice a week and grow my bankroll. And you can. It'll just take you forever. So you treat the buy-ins the same as online and live. I don't know why you wouldn't. I mean, you have to understand live is way softer than online. So therefore, you should be playing a little bit bigger live than online most of the time. If, you're, if you have an edge. I mean, if you don't have an edge, then, then no. Miguel says, am I reading this? <laughs> I guess I am. Let's see. So basically, the bluff will work most of the time if you're playing GTO and huge stakes. Uh, no, bluffs will not work a lot of the time. They only need to work something like a third of the time, and usually they'll work a third of the time. You need to be bluffing sometimes, and that's okay. Online is about 10,000 times harder. I don't think that's true. 
how do you jump from 890 to 180 person tournaments to 1800? Really, those games aren't all that different. Different. You probably just need to play slightly looser and more aggressive as the field gets bigger and bigger. Are foreign sites trustworthy? I don't know. I don't play on them. Almost certainly, though. You have to understand, sites don't really have an incentive to cheat you. They have an incentive to give you a fair game, make you have a good time, and collect all of your rank. They don't have to cheat you. How do you combat reverse tilt? You mean people who act as if they are on tilt? Um, I mean, I don't know. Don't, don't fall for it. Figure out who's good and who's going to be capable of um, show, giving off reverse tilt. Okay, two girls are off to sleep. See ya. Have a good evening. 1 a.m. is pretty late. What website do I play on? I pretty much only play now on Poker Stars and Party Poker when I'm out of the country. Miguel, I may not be seeing all of your chats. It said, and players had sevens. Maybe there's a problem with the chat. I don't know. Do you think it's better to play more table or only play as many as you feel comfortable with? I think whenever you're learning, you need to figure out how to play well before you start putting in a ton of volume. But clearly, putting in at least some volume will help you play well. Don't sit there and play one table. I think that's a mistake. What do you think about practicing on play chip sites? Bad idea. Put small, put a tiny amount of money into any site, really. It doesn't even have to be reputable. And play small stakes there. That way, at least people are caring about the money. How many hours have you played to increase your bankroll? Well, I've been playing poker for 15 years, so 15 years times however many hours I played each day. Quite a bit. Back when I was grinding it up, I played, I don't know, eight hours a day every day? No off days? Reverse tilt. Oh, you're referring to what I call happy tilt. When you get excited because you're playing well and things are going well for you. Uh, yeah, don't get cocky. Don't be an idiot. Realize that, yeah, things are going to go well for you. It doesn't mean you should be cocky. It means you should be ambivalent. Realize that the way things are going in the short run do not matter. does not matter. Which is your favorite tournament of online poker? I don't really get caught up in prestige. I don't think that it matters so much that um, it's the World Championship of Online Poker or the Power Series or whatever. It's nice that the sites have good series, but at the same time, I'm not like, oh my god, this is the power of best, and I need to play it. I don't really think like that. I think more of this is just a good value tournament. Same thing with the World Series main event. I mean, a lot of people think, oh, it's the World Series main event. It matters so much. I'm so excited. But in reality, it's like another tournament. It's another tournament with a huge amount of variance because there's a lot of people where you can maybe get rich. Um, I think Party Poker has good software. They, they just made a bunch of big upgrades, actually. Ryan says, how do you play on Poker Stars Abroad if you're an American citizen? Oh, it doesn't matter if you're an American citizen. You should definitely read the rules. You have to have a foreign bank account to get set up with them. You don't even have to have a foreign bank account. Definitely understand what you're signing up for. Um, there's a site called Poker Refugees. It'll help you get set up if you're an American. It costs money. You know, they, they're going to take care of helping you find a lease, helping you get a bank account if you want. But um, being a citizen does not matter. You have to be a resident of somewhere else. It's not so hard to become a resident. You just have to go live there for a bit. <laughs> I went to um, Budapest recently to get set up. You can also go to Canada or whatever. Do you think you can take advantage of being a girl player on a table full of guys? Um, definitely. I have no experience being a girl player at a table full of guys, but I'm very certain that many men either try to help the lady out and be friendly and nice like, I played with my mom at the table before, and people will show her their cards and tell her to fold, don't worry, and all stuff like that. Then you have the um, chauvinist pigs who are trying to teach the lady a lesson and get them out of their game. And, you know, those people are usually bluffing way too much. So if people are going to be way too nice to you or bluff you a lot, if you can figure that out, you'll just print money, right? Let's see... Do I look at my whole card before the action gets to me? I discussed this in one of my books. I think Jonathan Little on Live No Limit Cash Games. Basically, I it depends on my position. I'm sure you can figure out the positions where it's better to look later. All right, well, I'm going to go now. I have a coaching session I have to do in 20 minutes. Hope you all had fun. Hope you learned a little bit about pot odds. 
remember, it's always just a math problem. And then you have to figure out, should I deviate from the math in order to better exploit my opponents? So have a good day. Take your time. Enjoy yourselves. Please make sure to click subscribe. That way I can turn these 20s into 100s. One day I'll be popular. <laughs> Maybe, no, I probably won't be. I was never the cool kid. That's okay. I hope you all have a good day. Enjoy yourselves. Have a lot of fun. I'll talk to you tomorrow.